So welcome, uh, welcome to the middle part of lecture six, scheduled for the beginning of the third week in our eight week summer course on computer algorithms. Um, there are three different topics, three different problems, but they all share one algorithm technique in common. We will present in this middle part a greedy algorithm for minimizing the cache misses. The algorithm is very straightforward, and if you think about the problem, you may come up with it yourself. Uh, but you don't take this course because you can uh, figure it out all by yourself. No, the purpose of this lecture is to give illustrations of an exchange argument used to prove the optimality of the greedy algorithms. So greedy algorithms make locally an optimal decision, but is this way of working greedily if is that going to lead to a global optimum? So that's actually the main question that we ask in this lecture. Okay, memory inside the computer and perhaps also inside your head is organized in hierarchies. There are things that you know immediately um, and there are things for, for which you need to think, where have I seen this before? So we um, idealize things a little bit. We have uh, data that needs to be processed. A small amount of data can be accessed very quickly and we put it first in that quick memory. All data that is processed first passes through what we call the cache. All the other data resides in main memory. So, um, we use that fast memory, the cache, and uh, the main benefit is that if we need an element that is already in the fast memory, then we save time uh, by looking through uh, the slow memory. So we have then an algorithm to decide uh, what do we keep in cache when we need to put in a new element and what, or alternatively, uh, what do we evict from the cache. So we have a cache miss when the cache is completely full and the processor needs a data element that is not in the cache. So a new piece of data not in the cache needs to be processed. Okay, let's start with the first example. Um, so we have three different uh, items, A, a B, and C. Uh, we have a cache size, which is two. Um, so typically the number of different elements that we consider is always larger than the cache. Otherwise we could just put everything in the cache. So the order in which we process those items is fixed in advance. Uh, so here you see the order we have, we need to process a sequence of seven elements. So the first two steps are very straightforward. A and B are first. So A and B fill up the cache and then C comes in. So when C needs to be processed, the cache is full. So we cannot take A and B. So C has to enter the cache. Question is, uh, which element will you remove, uh, A or B? Let's see. So at the cache miss, uh, we evict A. Uh, then we need B. B is in the cache. Very good. C is in the cache in step four. And then we have our second uh, cache miss. Uh, when A comes in again, and then we replace um, uh, the first element uh, C by A. So uh, here the strategy is very simple. Uh, replace the first element uh, 
in the cache when you have a cache miss. Question is, uh, could we have done better? Um, so we evicted A, uh, with actually which was quite good. I mean, if we would have evicted B, then we would have had another cash miss in the second step. Um, so that would not have been all that well. So A evicting A was probably the right choice. So then uh, we had our other cash miss uh, when we needed A again. And here you can see that we probably, yeah, we probably can't do any better here. Um, so, so, but you can see there are possibilities. Uh, so there is always good to look at the brute force. In the brute force, so here the simple method was evicting the first element. Uh, it's not, it's not going to be a good idea. But uh, we could also evict the second element. So here there are two choices in every step. So we have uh, we have seven elements. Two of the first two steps are very simple, but then we have five uh, and five potential uh, new elements, uh, five potential choices. We have only two cash misses. Okay, so here is the greedy algorithm. Uh, you evict the element that is farthest in the future. So in the sequence of all elements that you have to process, you look for that element that is inside the cache and that is farthest away in the sequence. So that defines an eviction schedule. So an eviction schedule is an algorithm which uh, determines which items that you evict when a cache miss happens. So you also see the algorithm itself. Um, it runs, uh, so you need to process um, M elements. So you have your cache size. If the it element is not in the cache, uh, then actually you will uh, evict so you have to compute the farthest in the future so it is a very simple algorithm so running the algorithm is actually not really that difficult uh, it's also an efficient algorithm it terminates etc but proving the optimality is the important key point here um Okay, of all possible ways uh, that we can evict, um, we will only evict at a cache miss. Uh, so that's actually the logical thing, but there's nothing actually that says that if we don't have a cache miss, we could already preemptively start to bring new items in, that nothing prevents us from that. Uh, but we will see that it's not necessary to do this so we will only bring in items in the cache only when there is a request so this actually significantly reduces the complexity of the problem here okay so what is the important property here if you have a schedule that is non-reduced then there is a reduced schedule that brings in at most as many items as the non-reduced schedule. So we will not prove that property, but I can tell you that if you would bring in an algorithm, uh, an item before it is needed, you could simulate, so this would be the schedule S that is non-reduced, you could actually simulate the bringing in of that new item in that reduced schedule S hat when it is really needed. So it's clear that if you have a non-reduced schedule, 
that potentially you have to bring in more items. But for every non-reduced schedule, there is a reduced schedule. So the farthest in the future algorithm is indeed a reduced eviction schedule. So this already uh, reduces uh, the property. So we want to uh, now examine if our farthest in the future algorithm is that an optimal algorithm. Okay, let's look at the second example. Uh, so now we have the following sequence of elements and we have a somewhat larger cache. So the first three steps are straightforward. Then we come at a cache miss at step three after processing the first three elements. So we do have a cache miss and let us now execute of the, the farthest in future algorithm of the elements A, B, C, we have to compute that element that is uh, neatest latest. Uh, so you could run, you could see that you could do this in one, in one iteration. If you keep a counter uh, on the positions in the sequence of all the elements in the cache. So you run to your sequence and you record the first instance where you have the uh, element, where you encounter the element. The element with the largest index, so furthest, farthest away in the sequence will be removed. Um, so I could ask for that algorithm, but I just said it in words. It also is not really relevant. So that's a subroutine that you can compute. Um, you could even pre-compute. So with every item, you could record uh, the, the positions in the sequence. Okay, so here we see that C comes at the very end of the sequence. So it's natural then to evict C. Then with the cache, we are good until step six, E comes in. And uh, now we have another cache miss and we evict B. And that is the end of it. Okay, so we have two cache misses. Um, it's not a unique optimal uh, solution. So instead of C, we could have evicted B as well. So replaced, uh, instead of replacing C, replacing B. And then uh, we would have also have done with two cache misses. Um, so at this point in time, um, so there is choice. So uh, I must say that this algorithm does not continue here, but you can continue with the algorithm. But here the point is that what I want to say is that that farthest in the future is not the only one that leads to two cash misses. So if you can get all, also two cash misses with doing something else than farthest in future, could it be possible that you have fewer cash misses in total if you do something different other than farthest in future? So that's the purpose of this example here. Okay, uh, we will use now an exchange argument. So I'm at uh, halfway of what I budgeted the 30 minutes for this middle part of this lecture six. So uh, what is the uh, argument that we will be using? Uh, we have our schedule computed by the farthest in future. So that's the S underscore FF. So that's the one that we uh, propose as the optimal solution. But there are other uh, schedules uh, which have also 
the minimum number of cash misses. Now, uh, the point of these exchange arguments is that any optimal schedule can be transformed into a schedule which equals the farthest in future. In some sense, we did this already with the proposition of the non-reduced schedules. So if, if a schedule is non-reduced, well, you could, you, you say that you kind of preemptively put an, an item in there, but the farthest in the future will put it in there at the time when it's actually needed. So that's also a type of exchanged argument that we use there in the justification of that property. So if we can transform any optimal having the smallest number of cash meshes, any optimal schedule into the schedule computed by the farthest in future, then it means that the farthest in future, it could be that there are other optimal schedules, but it, the farthest in future will no more cash misses have than any other optimal schedule. And there are than any other schedule, uh, just any other schedule you can think of. And therefore we have the optimality of our greedy algorithm. Okay, let's prove this theorem now. So uh, the theorem goes by induction. So obviously we are going to have more elements to process than the size of the cache. Um, so it means then that in the base case, uh, we do an induction on a number of uh, elements, that actually the base case is very straightforward. Any scheduling, any uh, cache maintenance algorithm will first fill up the cache. Okay, that's the base case. We have many base cases, as many as the um, size of the cache. Okay. Um, and of course, also the uh, size of the cache is not zero. The sequence is also longer than the cache. Okay, so now comes uh, the induction step, step that we prove by a lemma. So let's look at uh, the statement of the lemma. So if we have in the first J request, so the farthest in future computed an eviction schedule, if we have that for any optimal schedule, it's the same as the, um, if there is an optimal schedule, that is the same as the one computed. So uh, the, 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 the same as the farthest in future. Then there is also an optimal reduced schedule S prime uh, for the next request, for the next J plus one request. So you see, we go induction on the number of requests. Okay, so let's consider then the J plus one request. Uh, so we call this request D. So we have a request for element D. By the induction hypothesis, uh, both an optimal reduced schedule, the minimum number of cash messes, is the same as what is computed uh, by the farthest in future. Same cash. Okay, there are three cases here to consider. Um, the first case is very simple. If uh, the item in the J plus one request is already in cash, then there's nothing that needs to be done. Uh, everything remains the same. So S prime is then just S, and S prime is S uh, computed by the farthest in future. If it is uh, not in the cache, and if you have that the optimal reduced schedule that we have been following so far, if it's the same element as farthest in future, then we have the same situation that S prime is S and is the schedule uh, computed by farthest in future. Okay, um, if it's not in cache, then both schedules will do something different. So the farthest in future will evict E 
and our optimal schedule so far will evict f and f is different from e that's the situation uh, that we now have to examine okay uh, let's do it um, so what do we have again d is not in the cache um, and uh, we have an optimal schedule for the first j requests which evicts f which is different from e evicted by the farthest in future so both of them have e and f sitting in there because they are entirely the same so i have the entire cache which is same and e and f so at the j plus one step what do we have s evicts f so we have e and d d is our new uh, element that is processed and uh, the farthest in future is going to evict e now what do we have to prove we have to prove that uh, by that the farthest in future does not lead to more cache misses uh, than any algorithm that has e in cache now i should say what's the difference between e and f well, E uh, is actually farther in the future needed than F. Okay, so uh, at any time now, so the number of cache, the number of elements brought in is actually exactly the same at this point. It's fine, uh, but let's now see that uh, J prime is in step that actually S and S prime take now a different action when we have G coming in. Okay, G um, is different from E, G different from F. So that's the first case. And then we can have that G is F or G is E. So these are the important uh, cases to consider. Keeping in mind what is in the cache of S and what is in the cache of the schedule computed by the farthest in future. Okay, um, I copied this reasoning from the textbook, uh, keeping the order of the cases. But I should actually say that uh, the third case, when the item requested at J prime is E, is actually the easiest case to handle. That whenever you have an, uh, whenever you have a case, uh, an if else case, uh, as a programmer deal with the case that is easiest well when e would be the next element um, in farthest of the future this cannot actually happen because farthest in the future evicted e implying that e was actually needed later than f so that's actually the case uh, where g should be f okay let's do the second case now if e gets evicted um, by s then actually we are in the same case um, if s would evict an e prime um, and that's not e then our new schedule s prime would actually bring e in the cache at that point um, now um, and in that case there would be again uh, the same as S, so E would be in the cache. Um, so the problem there is that this S prime would no longer be reduced because it actually doesn't bring um, G in the cache. So you, 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 you see if G equals F, then the optimal schedule might not need to bring it in. In that case, we can reduce it to a reduced eviction schedule, and then the caches for J plus one S prime are actually the same as S. In the last remaining case, is actually now the first case. Um, if uh, G is not E and G is not F, um, both cases S and S prime the caches are actually almost the same 
except for the e and the d well what we actually need, need to compute we need to compute an s prime that is actually the same as s and 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 that's actually what you can do so the actions are uh described here uh so if s in schedule s if e would be evicted replaced by g and s prime would evict f then they are actually uh the same so um that is then uh the conclusion so the point is we have either uh, the same cache um, that was the first case i talked about or otherwise we can reduce it uh, to a situation that doesn't lead to a different number of cache misses by this uh, pro property of the reduced eviction schedules so any optimal schedule that you can have via an exchange argument you can transform it into the schedule that is computed by the farthest in future and that proves the lemma and that also actually proves the theorem that the farthest in future algorithm is optimal okay um when i did the first part i gave a picture proof of the exchange argument i did not do this here um the the, the, the proof of the lemma is more complicated and then the exchange argument that we applied in the first part of the lecture so the second exercise um, is actually quite important therefore that you go back to the uh, second example and you run the farthest in future and at some point uh, there was another eviction schedule show that uh, with this exchange argument uh, you can actually um, that this exchange argument actually applies here so that this would help in the understanding of the proof of the lemma okay then i will conclude with uh, a next exercise um, so modern computers have multiple caches between the registers and main memory um, so consider an algorithm with two caches um, where you have a first cache that whenever it's in the first so every element that needs to be processed needs to get into the first cache but it also needs to get in there via the second cache um, so you consider two caches the second cache is uh, twice the size of the first cache can you formulate uh, a farthest in future version of the algorithm that to work with two caches um, the way to start on any uh, design on a good start for any design is always to think about an example you think about an example and you have two caches size two and size four and your sequence should be at least eight let's say um, develop a farthest in future strategy and reason so first of all does the farthest and future algorithm can that be formulated in this example um, formulate the example uh, formulate the algorithm so you will have some credit to work with a numerical example but you must uh, use pseudo code to formulate an algorithm which is an ordered step uh, an ordered sequence of unambiguously uh, unambiguous steps and that can be executed and that it also terminates so these were the four conditions that we stipulated on algorithms um so it, double caching is more complicated uh do the greedy algorithms for double caching uh can they still rely on something as simple as farthest in future do the exchange arguments still hold so that's the question 
Okay, I've reached uh, the end of the second half hour of uh, this lecture six. Um, we simply we still had a simple algorithm, but a far more complicated exchange argument. Um, so I hope it was not too confusing, and I strongly recommend you to work on the exercises.